we start? Yes. Yes? Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Mariana, Mariana Filidoni. I'm uh, from the music uh, school of uh, Havla from Germany. And today, I'm going to talk to you about the decline of the guitar after 1850s and the reason why. And we'll talk a bit why and why and when to commit the high road again. So, um, before we start that, before we start telling about why the guitar had started to, to wane, um, we have to remember a bit that the guitar at the very beginning of the 19th century was very popular. Um, this period was called as well guitar money. So if we separate the words, guitar and mania actually, Mania means um, if something someone is very passionate about, but on the line of crazy, like I like it so much that so I'm going to be crazy about it. So in this period, like beginning of the 19th century, the main cultural centers, the musical center was in Europe, was Vienna, London and Paris. And there many guitarists that we know already, they were great virtuosos, they maintained the, um, the stages such as uh, the Italian ones, Matteo Tarcassi, Legnani, Giuliani, Paganini also, he was a great guitarist. We have also the first appearance of composers that they were not so, they were not guitarists to write something for guitar, and Via Belli from Austria wrote a lot of music about the guitar. And from Spain, we have um, Awal and Sol, that they were mainly presented in Paris. So, after this period, one would think that uh, maybe the guitar will follow to go higher and more people would like to play it and more people would like to listen to music about it. But, actually no. <laughs> um, so the guitar after 1850 uh, started to, to win the, the interest of the guitar. But the exception to that was Italy and Spain. Uh, but in the main uh, cultural centers, such as Vienna, Paris, and London, they seem to have a guitar had a diminishing role. So it would be very interesting to, to read this uh, quote from Bellos and his treatise on instrumentation. It's, I will read it also for you. It says, unless one can play the guitar oneself, I repeat, it is impossible to write for it pieces in several voices containing passages that require all the resources of the instrument. Since the introduction of the piano into all homes, where there are any interest in music, the guitar has been gradually disappearing, except in Spain and in Italy. Some virtuosos have, have cultivated and are still cultivating it as a solo instrument. They are able to create pleasant and original effects with music. Otherwise, composers employ the guitar neither in the church nor in the theater or the concert hall. Its weak tone, which prevents its combination with other instruments or with uh, several singing voice or normal tone volume, is doubtless, uh, it's doubtless the cause of this. So, actually, from this quote, we can extract many, many reasons why the guitar was kind of neglected. The first one was that the most urban homes own the piano, so the, most of the families that can afford the piano and they were interested in music, they were using the piano rather than the guitar. Also at that point, uh, Vienna had, um, he was the, it was the leading city on the piano manufacture, so it was more easily accessible to the German-speaking home. Um, another important thing or reason that we can extract from this quote is that the working knowledge of the instrument is important in order to write for it. So Brillos was playing the guitar himself, so we know that his argument was founded, let's say. Um, a composer has to have a knowledge about the guitar or a bit about the guitar in order to write for it. And at that, point, at that period, in the musical universities, like the first one that they appear in the Vienna Academy or in the university in Leipzig, there was no guitar. The curriculum was not included the guitar. 
And in Vienna, the Academy was founded already in 1817. The guitar was entered as a main instrument uh, more than 100 years after. So that leads to another consequence that uh, since there was no guitar in the universities, whoever composer wanted to write for it didn't have a knowledge, so he wouldn't care, I think, or she wouldn't care. And rather than that, whoever wanted to learn the guitar had to go to private tutors. So the thing is that the, what, what we can understand is that the level couldn't be higher. The, it remained on an amateur level because of that. Another thing that we can extract from the quote is the weak tone. So apparently the guitar was very soft and as a result was not suitable for chamber music. That's very important because after we'll see a lot of things happening in chamber music for the guitar. So as a result also on all of this the, we have the musical isolation of the guitar. So the guitar was kind of alone and there was not important repertoire for, <laughs> for her. <laughs> okay. The guitar in Greek is uh, female. <laughs> I think also in Spanish. Okay, so, and last one, but that's this one. The last one is not from the quote. Uh, according to Brighton, the, that's, more, that's for London mostly, I think. Uh, we don't have, or we have a diminishing appearance on the benefit concert. So the benefit concert was actually a, a small form of kind of private concert that um, the artist could um, make themselves, so they can organize, sorry, themselves, so they could organize a concert with a repertoire, they could also maybe invite other guitarists to play or other musicians. They were responsible for the plays, for the instruments, for the tickets, for everything. So they were organizing all of these things and they were gaining also fame through that and good connections because if they were calling somebody else then the other one that would do the benefit concert would call them etc. But uh, those concerts started to appear in less and less and they were replaced by the recitals, by the yeah, solo recitals that they were dominating mostly from piano and from violin. Those things were more generic, maybe they, some of them they were related also to Germany or to German-speaking uh, regions, but not all of them. Now we'll look closely a bit to the German-speaking regions. And what I have here, yes. I have actually some quotes that I found from the, from the newspapers at that time. So this one, actually, it's from the um, Vienna, from a newspaper in Vienna, and it's referring to a concert of Mert, actually. I was very surprised when I edited this. So, yeah, it says the instrument, the guitar, is at least with us completely out of time. Even the hysterical ladies, whose only resource it was otherwise, have declared it out of the question, and apart from a few seamstresses in the suburbs, I only know an old doctor who blue, blossom, blue, sings and accompanies himself with the guitar. Of course, with the interest in the instrument, the interest in its virtuosos also had a twinkle. An empty hall at today's concert is a guarantee for the correctness of this statement. This is very bad. It's, it's very bad. I was so surprised when I read this. And we continue. The tragedy doesn't stop. Met from Vienna, whose eight string instrument exceeded its limits under his hand, and produced some surprising effects, was doing bad business. Ooh. Again, that was from uh, Leipzig. From, uh, yeah. Leipzig? How is Leipzig in, in English? Leipzig. Le yeah, Leipzig. <laughs> so, moving on to the same newspaper, another year. That I haven't found to which concert this referred. I think it was for uh, Regondi, I think, but I'm not sure. One admired the great artistry, purity, and precision of this excellent guitar player, but not without a picture of regret that he had wasted so much effort on a thankless instrument. 
And that was a comment from uh, a music director that had a great acceptance on, in Germany. His name is Stoll, his last name, his first name I couldn't find. And the last one, nevertheless, the guitar can never be used as a solo instrument for permanent interest. Not so good, not so good. So, what we learned more or less, that the, the guitar results were very poor received from the public and from the critics. It was maybe out of fashion, outdated, they didn't like it anymore. Uh, looking at it more closely, there are some people say that, specifically in Germany and in Austria, guitar had to fight piano on the classical uh, music, so in classical stages and stuff, but also on the pop music, has to fight with the zither. The, yeah, the zither. Uh, the zither was most um, famed, not famous, was used basically and had exceptions in Bavaria and in Austria. Uh, it was a um, folk instrument um, and it was mostly used for the, um, for the accompaniment of, of songs, for accompaniment of songs. So basically, one thing that guitar was doing a lot at that time that it was accompanying, uh, accompanying songs uh, with a zither now, it had we have to fight. One more thing that we see also from the above comments is that in the past, like late 18th, beginning 18th century, we had great virtuosos, or many virtuosos, from uh, Italy, from Spain, that they, they would, how do you say, they would show the abilities of the instrument. And for some years, we don't have. Or, in, in those reasons, I'm talking for, for Germany and Austria, or the ones that they were very good or very talented, they have immigrated. For example, uh, Schultz, Leonard Schultz, was a great virtuoso at that time and quite famous. Nobody knows him now, but it was. And he immigrated to London with his family. So at that point, we didn't have many people in, in Germany and in Austria that they could shine, let's say. Uh, we have another German quote, I think that from, yeah, from Alex Goetz. So this one, it's a bit strange. It says, at the end of the first half of the 19th century, little more was heard than the risky, strangely trained recitals of travelers, art concerts of artists and virtuosos such as Lignani, Giuliani, etc., which tended to deter the public, and as it's wrongly put today, the guitar as an accessible, let it sing. So, this guy here says that the virtuosos of the past made the guitar to seem so difficult that nobody else wanted to play it because it seemed so difficult. So, I don't know. When I read that, it seems quite ironic if you compare it with what we saw before, but anyway. So, that was more or less it, I think. Yes. Yes. Okay, now we move on a bit at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, and we start to see how the guitar grew on these years. So, we have the first one guitar clubs that they are appearing. Actually, by the, maybe that was in the beginning also in the 19th century, I'm not sure for that, but by the end, the um, associations, actually, the art associations were very important. Uh, in the bourgeois life, um, the art was seen as a way of life and it was an integral part of the society. Um, the understanding of the culture was as, is used as a medium that defines the identity of the participants and promotes the collectivity in the society. So it had also uh, somehow um, that the art will help also the society, will make better, better people. Um, going closely to musical association and guitar associations or guitar clubs, we can imagine that the vast majority of the participants were amateur players. Some of them were professional, but not all of them. Uh, the first one, and no, the very first, no, one of the first. <laughs> Maybe it's not the first, we don't know. 
uh, of Guitar Club was the Leipzig Guitar Club, and it was founded in 1977. On, the, on its example, there are starting many, many small guitar clubs um, in Germany and in Austria. I think the most important of them was um, the Munich Guitar Club and later the International Guitar Association that was founded in, in Munich, the, Internation the Internationale Guitaristenvereinigung, the IDV. Um, this organization, this association was, uh, was responsible for organized meetings, concerts, solos, and music. It was also the place that people could, uh, could um, use in order to promote their work. For example, like guitar composers or guitar builders, they could show their work there. And around 19, we have uh, the publication of the friend of the guitar, the guitar point. Uh, that was a newspaper, actually, containing all sorts of the news about the guitar, guitarists, composers, it had reductions for the people that they were, uh, that they were members, and it had music literature, interesting things, and also, yeah, that, that's important, that the guitar front was, um, was addressed to the international guitar community, is also reflected by the fact that it was uh, published in three languages, in English, in French, and in German. And in the beginning, when I started to read, I thought it was somebody did the translation, but no, it was like that, and that was very surprising, for me at least. We have the, um, for everything we have the pros and the cons. Now, the same we have for the guitar clubs. It's an interesting quote here from Hackley. He says that the phenomenon of joining forces to represent common interests is directly related to the lack of public appreciation. In music, it occurs above all in the case of non-orchestral instruments, and in the case of the guitar significantly for the first time in the second half of the 19th century when the guitar disappeared from the concert halls. So we have again more or less um, this phrase that the guitar was almost disappeared from the concert halls, and also that it, it lack of public appreciation, and that's why the associations were founded. So, from one point, the association were important because they preserved the guitar somehow in the limelight, but on the other hand, they, they had the guitar on a very, very uh, mediocre level because the vast majority of the members were amateurs. So, um, the low level performance was largely maintained and as well, that's also important, the majority of the guitar publication, in order to be accessible to them, was also easy. And the quality of the level of the concert followed the same path. And actually, there's something very interesting here. I, I told you before about this famous uh, guitarist, Leonard Schultz, who immigrated with his family in London. Uh, around 1840, I think, there was a visit from a very um, uh, rich man, a Russian nobleman, his name is Makar, and he visited London in order to meet him and Regondi. And he was so much impressed by Schultz that he didn't visit Regondi by the end of his trip. And he said to him that um, Schultz was also a composer, and he said to him that um, the publisher and also the people were forcing him not to, to make as easy as possible his composition because otherwise it wouldn't be accessible to them. So, of course, we have some other publications of higher level, but there are not so many. Yeah? So, as a conclusion to that, the Guitar Association played an important role in presenting, uh, preser preserving the guitar. However, its demise was inevitable and it was what kept the guitar at a moderate level. So, now, now we will listen some music. So we have um, a very important guitarist. I think only the, the Germans maybe we know it, but the rest, not so much. I think he's, he hasn't gained uh, a 
appreciation. His name is Heinrich Albert, and he was born in Wurzburg, in the north of Bavaria, in 1870. Actually, he was a professional orchestra musician. He was playing the horn, and he had a permanent position in the Keim Orchestra, today's Munich Philharmonic. He had the chance actually to perform uh, under a uh, great maestro such as, such as Mahler as a, as a horn player. Yeah? And at one point in, in a trip that he did, he got to know the guitar. He was very impressed by the sound and the instrument and he, he wanted to play it. And he liked it so much that he actually gave up uh, the horn and his position in the Philharmonie. And since 1892, he referred to himself as a classical guitarist and, and mandolin, and as a teacher also. Um, he mainly focused on two things about the guitar, I mean, the education gap. The guitar still was not in the university, so there was not methods. Still, I'm talking about Germany, yeah? Germany and Austria, not in general. So there were not uh, specific methods and a way that somebody would prove that one of teaching the guitar. And there was a big gap in chamber music. There were no pieces for, or no, almost no pieces for chamber music that they, were, they could also bring up the instrument, the guitar, not only the accompaniment of songs and stuff. So he composed several works for solo guitar and chamber music, but more importantly, methods also for accompaniments, for song accompaniment as well as pedagogical methods for learning the instrument. Something also interesting that he tried to do, it was also to, to get used to the guitar audience, not to listen the easy pieces, in his opinion, eh? the light pieces that they were mostly promoting by the guitar associations, but also pieces like uh, Bach and Bizet. For example, he transcribed suites for Bizet and he was trying to put on the first program some more serious music, let's say, according to him, always. His greatest contribution, though, was his method, modern guitar So modern course in artistic guitar playing, published in 1923 in four volumes. And that is very important. This book was used by the first teacher of guitar in the Vienna Academy. That was the first, actually, academy that had a guitar as a main instrument to study. So that's the, the book. It was in four volumes. The one was focusing on the folk songs for the guitar. The one, the guitar as an accompaniment instrument only for songs. The one as guitar, guitar as solo. And the fourth one as guitar as virtuosic instrument. So, maybe, maybe we can listen to a solo piece that he wrote. He tried to write a lot of music about this.
And now we are moving on to the Munich Quartet, one of the very first professional guitar quartets in Europe. Uh, Albert Heinrich was a part of it, but he didn't found it. Um, Fritz Buerk found it with Hermann Reis and Karl Kern. Yeah? They were amateurs, they were very keen, uh, keen amateurs, but they were very prominent and they wanted to do stuff with a, with a quartet, with a guitar. And it was founded, I think, in 19, yeah, 1907. And the idea was to form a guitar, actually, on the principal, uh, to form a, a guitar quartet on the principal of the string quartet. So, um, after two years, uh, Heinrich Albert was uh, invited to be a part of the quartet. The, the founder, Buek, wanted to, to have him uh, in the quartet because he was the most famous guitarist in Bavaria, actually. He had gained a, lo a lot of great reputation at that time, Albert. So, Heinrich Albert, so he wanted him very, very much on the quartet. Um, in order to achieve this idea of the string quartet in the guitar, they used two third, uh, third guitars, one normal and one queen pass guitar. So the third guitar were, were tuned a minor third higher. Uh, in the photo that we saw before, actually, there was also that the second one was the Lira Terza. It had 24 frets with sympathetic strings. The Quinto Basso guitar had, it was a fifth lower, and yeah, it was a fifth lower, and it had one lower open string. And on the photo, this? this one, with the, yeah, the one on the very, very right, was the Wappenforten guitar that was mandolin shaped, and it had open strings that they were tuned chromatically. Um, this quartet had a great success. Uh, they did numerous appearances throughout Germany, Austria, but mostly, again, on guitar society meetings. They had many cooperations with other musicians and other guitarists, such as Mozani and with the violinist Fritz Vogel. Um, they inspired other guitarists to create also uh, quartets like this one. Many of them, they, they referred like we are doing our quartet as uh, after the Munich model that says, for example, Bernil Quartet that was founded in 1925. Um, yes, after the First World War, Albert Heinrich he left the quartet and his place took the very famous guitar maker, Hermann Hausel. Um, what I've read is the, the quartet wanted him a lot because they were experimenting a lot of the instruments also. Like, maybe we're going to play with other instruments, what we have to make, and it was great for them to have also a bit in the quartet. So, that was also one of the reasons. Um, one more thing that is important for Heinrich is that he was um, appointed guitarist of the Royal Theatre and in the 1909 uh, they gave him the prize of the court chamber virtuoso as a guitarist. So if we think like 10 minutes ago that like Berlioz basically was saying that the guitar it's not good enough to be in a chamber music ensemble that couldn't do chamber music and there was many people that were saying that. This is like 30 or 40 years after it's, I don't know, it's a, like a great success, I think, for the guitar. Um, yes, that's it. Ah, let's hear some, uh, one part of the music.
about his music. He, he wrote a lot of music. Chamber music for guitar, solo music, he wrote many pieces. But he, he played himself and his students. Moving on to the guitar panel in the university. Um, as we said before, like the BNL Academy was founded in 1820, no, 14, 1814, yes, yes. And so more than 100 years after, finally, the guitar entered the university. So, and I think it was in the, Vienna was the first, was the first official educational institution in Europe to introduce the guitar. Um, the curriculum was based on the method of uh, Albert Heimlich. And yeah, until then, at least in the Vienna Academy, it was possible somebody to study the guitar, to, not to study. He, could he or she could take it as a um, second instrument and have an idea, uh, but and could take, I think, a diploma for a pedagogical reason, yeah, have a degree in pedagogical training uh, with a state examination, but until then it was not accepted as a main instrument with the curriculum, etc. The first professor was Jacob Portner, a guitarist who was born in Innsbruck and working as the guitarist of the Vienna Staatsoper, of the, of the opera in Vienna. Um, one of uh, his students was the fame, famous Carl Shade, I think all of us would have played an arrangement of his. I think all of us. We have this yellow page with these blue letters. And um, so he was one of his students. And yeah, the first, the first guitar curriculum seems to be particularly interesting and complete. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was better from the ones that we have now. Uh, it included a wide range of repertoire. You, you should play solo, you should play chamber music, accompaniment works. Actually, if I remember well, like the first year, you were obliged to, to play a lot of chamber music, to do a lot of accompaniment, and after the next three years, you were focusing on the solo. The total duration of the studies were six years, so there was divided in two sections. The first three years were chamber music, uh, accompaniment, all these kind of things, playing with other instruments, but after was focusing more on the on the solo. Yes, that was more or less for the entry entrance of the guitar uh, in the universities. And as a consequence, we can imagine that after than that, the guitar started to starting to reappearing again and introducing itself in another way, in a more respected way, let's say. Uh, in that matter, help Heinrich Albert and Ferdinand Ribay. Uh, Ferdinand Ribay, he started gaining some fame again, I think the last 10 years or, well, yeah, 10 years. And he was a very important figure for the guitar. Uh, he has centrally been brought back to, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Okay, yes. The, uh, what I said, yeah. He, his work contributed decisively, decisively to the renaissance of the guitar in Austria and Germany. Uh, he was a composer um, and he completed his studies with honors and he was an amateur, amateur singer. Uh, he was working as a choirmaster in an amateur choral, choral society. And very, very soon he gained a lot, of, uh, a lot of good reputation as a composer, mainly for voice. Since 1920, he, was, uh, he had a permanent position in the Vienna Academy as a piano teacher. Before that, he also had, he was also there as a piano teacher, but not in a permanent basis. And then there he came mostly in contact with partner and his student, he had the opportunity to, to come close to the guitar and see how the instrument works and work with many, many students of his. And very, very fast he could realize that the, in the guitar at that time there was a huge gap in the chamber music repertoire and he wrote a lot, a lot for it and still that's very important that he had the opportunity to try the music at that moment with the students and he didn't have to play the guitar himself 
So, um, yes, mm -hmm. we have many, uh, many sources that say that the, the concerts where the concerts of his music about the guitar were not poorly uh, received as some years ago. Uh, there were people saying that um, it's, it's surprising that we see the guitar as not only as a, an instrument that does simply like accompaniment, but with other instruments we can see the guitar to shine. Um, he wrote more or less 400 works for the guitar. And most of these were for chamber music. Despite, though, for his contributions to the world of music and especially to the guitar, he lost his job uh, in the academy after the conquest of Austria by the Germans in uh, 1938. Fortunately, his work is slowly gaining the value it deserves today. We can listen to some of his music. Oh, no. That's for guitar and violin. And so not on the same key that we listened before as C minor. see that the guitar in, uh, in Europe but mainly also in Germany and in Austria it was it had after the 1850 uh, period and position but after that mainly when it entered to the university started to have again appreciation and place on the concert life so we see that education is very important for that, and actually, one one interesting thing that I wrote, I I wrote, I read, I with the people from the people that they were dealing with uh, Heinrich Alfred's work, it was like at that moment um, everybody was focusing more on the Spanish um, uh, composers for Tarega, and they were they were a bit bitter because they were saying that. Um, Albert Heinrich tried to do some original work of his own uh, and not to do transcriptions and that's why that everybody had, uh, had turned more to the Spanish music because it was more, more famous, already famous in the ears because it was like transcriptions of operas and stuff. This is what I read. It's not, I don't say. And yes, that's it. Thanks for listening.
Ferdinand Rivet, uh, he was guitarist. He, he was a composer. composer. He was a composer. His, I think his niece was a guitarist. His niece. You know what niece? Sí, sí, sí. He, I, I think after a while he, he probably had the uh, knowledge of the guitar, but he, he wasn't a guitarist and he didn't start as a guitarist. Mm -hmm. There are modern publications by, by Rivine. There are a modern publication. Yes. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. There are. Yeah. Oh, see? Yeah, there is. Um, With all the, uh, his work? I don't know if it's with all of his work because apparently he wrote many pieces. But there is a, a person, uh, Mantovani. Uh, I don't, I don't remember his uh, his uh, first name. But he did a PhD. He's uh, on on Rivai, and he published a lot of uh, a lot of uh, of his pieces. And I think he recorded also. Okay. Yes. Another question. <laughs> tell me, tell me. The quarter of, of Germany play music of Baroque, uh, for example, Bach? That wasn't a quartet. That was the, the Heinrich Albert, yes. He wanted to play some serious music according to his, to educate a bit more the audience, not to hear only light music and easy music. So the first program, he, he was putting transcriptions of uh, Bizet also, uh -huh. and these pieces. Entiendes? <laughs> okay, that's it? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.